Kanse, good morning or good afternoon from wherever you are. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Chris Najkate. Thank you for joining us. An elderly man from the Pine Mutang First Nation north of Winnipeg has some long awaited news. Over half a century ago, he was convicted of murder. Now he was granted a new trial with more on this. Here's T.R. Wheatley. These lawyers from Innocence Canada are happy this day has arrived. Their client, Clarence Woodhouse, was granted a new trial. 50 years after he was sentenced to life in prison with three other First Nations men for killing Ting Fong Chan while he was walking home in Winnipeg. James Lockyer is a lawyer with Innocence Canada. He's been working on this case. That's off his criminal record and uh, he's, facing, he's facing a new trial for it. We, we're confident that the Crown will uh, uh, agree that he should be acquitted at his new trial. Last year, Brian Anderson and Alan Woodhouse were acquitted of the same murder. Clarence's brother Russell was also convicted, but he died in 2011. The killing in question happened in July 1973. Woodhouse and the others always maintained their innocence and say they were forced to sign confessions. The problem, none of the men from Pine Mutang in central Manitoba could understand English as they were all Soto speakers. On top of that, Woodhouse and the others say they were assaulted by Winnipeg police. They also faced an all-white jury. We uh, talked to Manitoba about trying to isolate and identify other cases of wrongful convictions of indig Indigenous uh, men and women back in that era. Lockyer said back then the justice system was not favourable and often racist. APTN reached out to Manitoba's Justice Minister for comment, but as of airtime, their request was not answered. Woodhouse and his family received the big news before the long weekend. However, there hasn't been a date set for the new trial. In the meantime, Woodhouse has been out on bail while Justice Canada considered his case. He is living in Winnipeg with his son and five grandchildren. T.R. Wheatley, APTN National News, Winnipeg. After three years, the Pimichikamak Cree Nation in northern Manitoba will present its findings of their ground-penetrating radar investigation today. The search happened at the site of the St. Joseph Residential School, also known as the Cross Lake Indian Residential School. Pimichikamak Cree Nation, along with Saskatoon-based company Axiom Group, began the search in 2021 and concluded it two years later. Investigators said they were aiming to uncover evidence related to the residential school and Indigenous students who never came home. St. Joseph's Residential School opened in 1912 and was run primarily by the Roman Catholic Church and was the primary residential school in northern Manitoba. It was destroyed by a fire and rebuilt and then closed in 1969. A press conference will be held at Pimachikamak at 2 p.m. today with Chief David Monias for council chiefs and residential school survivors. We will bring you more updates on this in our evening APTN National Newscast and on our website at aptnnews.ca. The Dekumloops uh, Tshikwepmek First Nation in Vancouver's Roman Catholic Archdiocese have released the details of a sacred covenant. It lays out the next steps as work continues to confirm the existence of possible unmarked graves at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. As CTV's Ben Milger reports, the Archbishop also spoke out against those who deny this painful history. It has been more than three years since the Dekumloops to Shikwetmek announced the discovery of 215 possible unmarked children's graves at the site of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. The First Nation is now weighing whether more intrusive investigative techniques are warranted. And whether through, you know, that's going to be through the extraction of DNA, exhumation, and or other steps. We know that these are, you know, more intrusive steps, but also um, a disturbance of remains, you know, may be taken to find that truth. The Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Vancouver has committed to help with that work. At a Wednesday news conference, it shared details of a sacred covenant with the First Nation, which was signed on Easter Sunday. It promises to provide world-renowned experts using the latest technology to assist to come loops to Shikwetmek investigators. To help them get the answers to questions that they deserve. We respect that they have so much work to do within their communities and we stand ready as always to follow their lead. 
Some have sought to discredit the First Nation in the years since the announcement of the possible unmarked graves, including the head of the Catholic League, one of the largest religious organizations in the United States. It doesn't sit well with Vancouver's Archbishop. To deny that the residential school system had a negative effect and that many students died while registered at the school, that's just... <laughs> He's just, he's just wrong. The Tecumlips to Shequetmex say not all the details have been made public. And there's a reason for that. Our investigative findings and our investigative steps are currently being kept confidential to preserve the integrity of the investigation. The First Nation says further details will be announced when it decides how to proceed with next steps. Ben Milger, CTV News, Vancouver. And if you are triggered by these stories, the National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available for survivors and others who might need support. That number is 1-866-925-4419. First Nation leaders are set to gather in Montreal next week for the Assembly of First Nations Annual General Assembly. The agenda includes updates on First Nations policing and the investigation and audit of the AFN's financial and management policies. There are also currently more than 70 resolutions for leaders to vote on. Our Dennis Ward brings us an update. One of the resolutions coming to the AFN AGA could change the way a national chief is elected. Last December, it took two days and six ballots for Cindy Woodhouse Nipanak to meet the 60% of ballots cast threshold. Next week, a resolution looks to address national chief election voting deadlocks. If passed, when there are only two candidates remaining, the chief electoral officer shall announce one last ballot will be conducted and the candidate with the most votes shall be declared the winner, even if that candidate does not reach the 60% benchmark. The same resolution would also see a big jump in the amount of money a candidate can spend during a campaign, jumping from $35,000 to $100,000. Another resolution calls for an independent inquiry into the deaths of Rebecca Contois, Morgan Harris, Mercedes Myron and Buffalo Woman. The inquiry would be conducted by First Nations commissioners and would have a specific focus on the Winnipeg Police Service and Province of Manitoba's initial and ongoing efforts to investigate and locate the missing women. The AFN AGA will still be taking place as a verdict in the Jeremy Skibitsky trial comes down on July 11th. There are other resolutions that call for addressing the chronic underfunding of education, a shortfall the AFN has identified as $28 billion, and one that would, quote, reaffirm the rejection and denouncing of illegitimate rights assertions of the Métis within B.C., Ontario and Labrador. There's also a call to rescind previous resolutions dating back to the 1980s in support of the extradition of Leonard Peltier to Canada. The resolution makes reference to the role Peltier is alleged to have played in the interrogation of Annie Mae Pictou Aquash and Peltier's public support of her convicted killer. Peltier's latest bid for parole on his two first-degree murder convictions was denied on July 2nd. The AFN AGA gets underway on July 9th. Members of the Kihiwan Cree Nation in Alberta voted on changes to their election laws yesterday. APTN's Chris Stewart spoke to one band member who was concerned some of the changes are not for the better. Tyler Young Chief is a band member of Kihiwan Cree Nation, now living in BC. He says that he has serious concerns about Wednesday's vote by band members to make changes to their election code. The changes would now allow chief and council to run in as many consecutive terms as they want. The current law only allows two consecutive terms. The proposed changes doesn't mention any term limits. One of the reasons why a new election law was, was created in 2017 was because we wanted to avoid career politicians. That's why we instituted a two-term limit. And currently our chief and four other councillors have served their second so they were well aware of what the uh, requirement was. And to open up the idea of changing that with three months left in their term, you know, to me, that's a manipulation of the way the system is supposed to be set up. Another change to the law would allow band members to be the electoral officer. A change, Young Chief says, could invite favoritism. 
that's the whole point of rule of law is to have a bipartisan person in that area so we can't have a potential corrupt uh, election process. And with this new uh, changes to this election law, it opens it back up to have a band member as the EO, and then it has the opens it up for chief and council to appoint three band members as an appeals tribunal. So you can't tell me that's not heavily favored. He says two weeks notice of the vote is not enough time for people to make up their minds on the proposed new changes. I actually work as hard as I can to inform as many members as I know either on reserve or off reserve about the changes that are, are proposed. And I've, I've worked hard in my spare time doing that. So to allow them the chance to have an informed vote. Chief Trevor John and councillors were not at the band office when APTN visited for comment last week. Today, APTN was told they were in meetings off reserve. The vote to amend the electoral code takes place tomorrow. The election is expected September 29th or earlier. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Key Win, Cree Nation. We're always looking for new story ideas like the one you just saw or any other stories coming up on the calendar. Here's how you can get a hold of us. If you have a story you want to share, send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories you may have missed, go to aptnnews.ca. You can find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, LinkedIn, and X. And you can watch this newscast from anywhere on your phone on YouTube. Make sure to hit the follow and like APTN News button to join the conversation and see our latest stories. After many years, three First Nations in Manitoba will finally have a seat at the decision-making table when it comes to commercial forestry. Stick around, we'll be right back. Welcome back. A new agreement in Manitoba will see three First Nations in the province included in the development of a 20-year forest management plan in the Swan Valley area. The plan aims to protect the three First Nations traditional lands and treaty rights in commercial forestry licensing agreements. The treaty four First Nations signed onto the agreement are Menezegolzibi Ajnishnabe, Waskwa Sapik First Nation, and Sapotoweak Cree Nation. The agreement ensures consultations between the First Nations in the province and logging company Louisiana Pacific, who has been harvesting timber in the Swan Valley area since 1994. Two of the First Nations filed lawsuits against the province in 2022 for decades without meaningful consultation about the project, which has continued operating without a management plan since 2006. Now all the signatories are calling the agreement economic reconciliation. Waskwesa Peak Chief Elwood Zastry says the agreement establishes an independent review panel to monitor the project for compliance over the next 20 years. For more than a decade, we have been raising concerns about Manitoba's failure to consider the protection of our treaty rights and a fair resource sharing when making decisions about Louisiana Pacific ability to cut trees from our ancestral uh, lands. For many years, we were shut out of our con the conversations which had a direct impact on our territories. With each passing year, Indigenous people continue to move forward on sovereignty and reclamation, including for our ceremonial medicines. The First Nations University of Canada in Regina, Saskatchewan has been producing natural tobacco, free of any chemicals and only for ceremonial use. Tyrone Perot with the First Nations University went to find out more and brings us this story. It's just considered just like gold. The First Nations University of Canada is taking a novel approach to producing tobacco for ceremonial purposes. Vincent Ziffel is an associate chemistry professor at FNU. He's growing natural tobacco in a seemingly unnatural way, using hydroponics in a lab. The goal here is to work with elders to harvest natural tobacco free of additives or uh, pesticides, etc. Um, and uh, have ways to provide this tobacco to others that request it or need it to work with elders in a traditional sense or to follow proper protocol. But there is more to the plant. It goes beyond the walls of the university. The tobacco grown here will be distributed in a very unique way. When one uses it in a way that uh, respects proper protocol, 
um, and that pouch is empty, they can send it back and we'll be happy to refill it and continue the process. Historically, tobacco has always been a part of Indigenous cultures. It's used in everything from smudging to asking for help to sweat lodges. Dennis Omiyasu is one of the elders in residence at FNU. He stresses the importance of tobacco in Indigenous culture. It's just considered just like gold because there are other people, other societies that need that, that sacred tobacco. This tobacco, harvested traditionally at the university, will be a welcomed replacement for commercial tobacco that is often used in ceremony. The practice of protocol of offering tobacco will not be swept on a wayside and forgotten, but it continues on, you know, and that's called respect. This is Tyrone Perot reporting for Indigenize, First Nations University of Canada. Stick around because when we return, we'll introduce you to a blues rock guitarist and artist from BC's Alert Bay. We're back in less than three minutes. Over on the East Coast, St. John's 13, Charlottetown 28. The Grand River 11, Hujuac 20. Val d'Or 24, Seguene 25. Sarnia 30, Peterborough 28. Rainy and Sioux Lookout 23, Timmins 24. Thompson 25, God's Lake 24. Winnipeg 24, Barron's River 23. Swift Current 22, Yorkton 24. Buffalo Narrows 26, Stony Rapids 22. Grand Prairie 15, Fort Chippewan 24 and Sunny. Lethbridge 20, Edmonton 18. Tofino 22, Penticton 26. Prince Rupert 16, Fort Nelson 24. Beaver Creek 22, Mayo 23. Yellowknife 20, Wrigley 24. Inuvik 18, Colville Lake 17. Baker Lake 14, Chesterfield 15. Iqaluit 10, Arctic Bay 5. If you like to sing to the blues or rock out to thrilling guitar solos, we've got a great guest for you. 23-year-old Garrett T. Willie grew up in British Columbia's Alert Bay, which is Namgis First Nation and King Cumlet Inlet. He's said to have built his first guitar out of cardboard and now shreds on the real thing at festivals across the country. Blues musicians like Howlin' Wolf and rock bands like ACDC have inspired the young artist. He released his debut album, Same Pain, in September of last year. Dennis Ward spoke with Garrett T. Willie, who joined him from Campbell River, BC. Garrett, thanks so much for being with us here today. Uh, can you tell us a bit about you know, how long you've been playing music for and how you describe your music for people who've never heard it? Yeah, sure. I've been playing since about 2007. I was born in 2000. Well, I was born in 2000, so I was eight years old. Um, however long ago that was. But uh, yeah, so I've been playing since then. My my dad got me a guitar when I was about that age, and uh, yeah, I kind of I got into it just from hearing the music around the house. You know, uh, my dad listened to a lot of ACDC and a lot of Rolling Stones and things like that, and yeah, that's kind of just how I got going, you know, watching the old concert tapes and stuff. So I was kind of bred into it. <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, well, you're quite the masterful guitar player, a booming voice. Uh, you mentioned some classic rock uh, giants there, and you, you sound a bit like that. Uh, but you mentioned that you didn't want to replicate anyone else's music. Why is it important uh, for you to say as a, a, a rock and blues musician? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I... I guess, you know, I, when you're starting out, right, you know, you you kind of, you emulate your heroes, right? So I, I learned how to sort of play like Keith Richards and sort of get his style. Angus Young is probably, uh, you know, the leading, uh, the leading influence, I guess you can say, in my sound nowadays. And uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan's another big one. But uh, yeah, I just kind of want to do, do good rock and roll music, you know? with a touch of blues roots in there and kind of just do it the way that 
that we do it, you know. Uh, you released your debut album uh, last year, Same Pain. Uh, is that a pretty proud moment for you in your career? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that all kind of happened really fast. You know, we, I started co-writing with a guy named Parker Bosley in Vancouver, and uh, it was a period of about six months. You know, we did seven songs together, and I brought three songs that I wanted to record, you know, the live off the floor ones. And... Uh, yeah, it just kind of came together. We recorded the album, we self-released, and it's uh, it's gotten quite a bit of traction. You know, it's it's gotten us quite a bit of business and shows across Canada and a little bit in the states too. So it's been nice. Yeah. Well, as I said, we were listening to it uh, right before the interview here. It's uh, great stuff. Uh, you say you're a country boy who grew up with a tough life, but your dreams of making music helped you get through it. Uh, what's, what messages are you hoping to get across with your artistic abilities now? Well, you know, I, I think uh, the main thing that I would share with the youth um, is, you know, the goal is to get out of the res, not to stay there. The opportunities are outside. Right. That's what I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to do that, you know, with my dad, uh, you know, um, working in the city and things like that. Well, by the city, I mean Campbell River, which is kind of not that big. <laughs> and uh, so I got opportunity to sort of see life outside, you know, um, of, of Alert Bay where I grew up. And, you know, just uh, got out there to, to see what it was about, you know, worked really hard to establish myself in the music business and the, the touring scene and stuff like that and i think uh that's what everybody should do you know if they can is to get out see what it's all about then you can form your life and you know you can go back if you want but yeah that's kind of what i got to say yeah. uh garrett any uh musicians you're hoping to collaborate with in the future yeah well you know obvious ones like uh the rolling stones um you know, I'd really like to get the opportunity to open for ACDC and the Stones. But uh, mainly, I just want to play pool with them. Yeah. <laughs> pool, man, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, the Stones are coming to Vancouver soon. Maybe they'll uh, let you open for them. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> uh, Garrett, appreciate you taking some time for us. Uh, congrats and wish you all the best. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, Garrett and Dennis. That's your midday newscast for this Wednesday, July 3rd. We'll be back again in a few hours to bring you more stories. From everyone here in our HQ in Winnipeg, from our reporters across the country, miigwech, masicho, hai hai. Thank you for watching.